and you know that the reason they're hiring you is to give them a project or product that they can use uh you know whatever no matter what it is usually with us it's physical products of some yeah. kind and they want it to work you know the product isn't it isn't necessarily the product it's them accomplishing what they want to do with you know the robot or whatever yeah and that's you know i think that's where a lot of time and material falls short is you don't actually get to make sure that it is you know you're you're involved in the successful completion oh, of i still stay awake at night thinking of client success you know and oh i do too or not. yeah and you know uh, we got into this business probably because we wanted to help you know we love solving problems first of yeah. all and we want uh you know our clients to be successful you know they're coming to us to make money they're spending yeah. money to make money they're yeah. taking risk and you know i i want to go through every you know possible way that i can make them money yeah uh in their uh in their you know their endeavor here that's certainly an admirable goal yeah. Welcome to Collaborative with Spencer Krauss. This is a place for accomplished professionals to talk about their life and their work in an informal and hopefully an insightful way. If you like what you see, hit subscribe below. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Corey Rasmussen. Uh, Corey is a mechanical engineer with quite a few years of experience. Uh, he's designed pretty much every cherry picker you've ever seen. Uh, he's got his own engineering company, Rasmussen Design. Mm -hmm. And uh, he built a roller coaster in his backyard. I did. Also, welcome to the pod, Corey. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Spencer. Appreciate being here in lovely Pittsburgh. Uh, I'm, I'm in Durham, North Carolina, up here on vacation. So. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to come and uh, hang out. This is actually the first time we've ever met in person. Yeah, it's really nice. I think we've actually, been talking what about a year now. Yeah, like since like at least early pandemic. I feel like. Yeah, it, it was definitely pandemic times. So I, I want to say it was like last summer. Yeah. And uh, you know, really appreciate getting to know Spencer today and um, coming out here and. Yeah, happy to have you, know, buddy. Just uh, you know, learning more about robotics and uh, you know what Spencer's what Spencer's really like. Horrible person. Yeah, exactly. Jerk. <laughs> no, I, I, as you mentioned, I do have a roller coaster, and uh, actually, that's part of the reason I'm out here. Is uh, me and my family were doing a roller coaster tour. Which cool. Is, we're we're halfway through it. We've done uh, Kings Island and Cedar Park in uh, Ohio. Nice. And then we're doing Kennywood tomorrow, and then we're going to go back and do uh, Carowinds in North Carolina. Nice. So we're we're halfway there. We're we're holding it together. This is day, I think, nine of our vacation, so that's it's getting on the lengthy side. Yeah, it's, I haven't been out that long in a while. Yep. At least a few years. <laughs> anyway, yes, I, uh, sorry. No, no, it's all good. Um, so what, I guess, maybe a good place to start then, since we're on roller coasters, is what got you to want to build one in your backyard? That would be considered insane by a lot of people's standards. So the, the first thing is, is I didn't, this is not the first time I've done it. <laughs> so i've always loved roller coasters uh when i was i was uh in eighth grade i actually went to a six flags magic mountain i grew up in southern california oh cool and what part was, of southern california if I can ask. Huh? what part of southern california oh uh anaheim nice nice so we uh came back and i was like i'm gonna build my own roller coaster and i knew nothing <laughs> of engineering i'm in eighth grade <laughs> and I'm out there, you know, finding all sorts of scrap wood. And I remember uh, my dad was like, what are you doing? And, you know, just having to explain all that to him. And uh, it really ended up being just a, a fun learning experience. We had one rider and it didn't go well. Honest. <laughs> Luckily, the thing was only like four feet tall. So no, no real injuries. And how long was the... Uh... Uh, it was probably 20 feet or so I mean, that's something. About four feet high yeah just a little it's a linear little cart yes it had a, a small turn in there and then it had a brake system and kind of go up on it and that's when she actually flipped over <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then rolled back and uh just a fun experience uh i learned a lot uh but it wasn't until um who was the brave soul who rode that can i ask her uh, uh it, I don't, I don't even remember. Uh, <laughs> I can see her face, but I can't remember her name. Uh, I think it was Emily. Around the block. That's funny. Uh, it was one of my sister's friends. She oh, was cool. light enough to to ride it and everything. Anyway, 
<laughs> That's amazing. So going to my current roller coaster, and if you want to uh, take a gander at it, if you search on YouTube for uh, best launch coaster, and you scroll down like three or four, you'll see a picture of Top Thrill Dragster. For those I searched people. best backyard launch coaster, and it was number one. There you go. Best backyard launch coaster, because there's not that many of them. And uh, you'll see a picture of um, Top Thrill Dragster with a kid with some green Crocs on. It's that one. <laughs> uh, but I really wanted to do it because I've always, uh, you know, COVID hit last year and I really had uh, no work and I had some money and I thought, man, it'd be fun to build one and I can use it as a business write off by saying it's a, it's a, uh, make a course. So yeah. is a, is all 100% a tax free. So this is for the mentor roller coaster. Yes. This is uh for my, my website, mentored com, where, uh, I, go through some mechanical situations and stuff like that, right on uh, different aspects of mechanical engineering and how uh, engineers, you know, just really trying to get young engineers up to speed uh, faster than they can, you know, through the mentoring process at your company or whatever. Well, yeah. And I would say like, I mean, our university system is pretty, I don't want to talk too much shit, but like a little bit flawed in the sense that well, we could talk for days on that. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, uh, it's very, we're going to teach you the basics of this, but they teach, you know, especially in mechanical engineering, I got to take all sorts of fluids and thermo. And that's a lot of stuff that I've never touched. I have no desire to ever <laughs> really use them. Now I will say that it is important to understand how he transfers. Uh, so knowing the basics there is somewhat important, but there's a lot of, you know, I wish you could specialize more in yeah. the university setting. Well, Actually. I will say, I mean, there's a lot of stuff I never used in the universe, but one thing I wish I had touched more that I, admittedly, it's a weak point, is linear algebra. I never really, I, I purposely majored in computer science as an undergraduate, so I wouldn't have to take too much math. I did really well in all the math I took. I just didn't enjoy it that much because it felt not applied. Right. Well, that was the only course in college I failed. Nice. And then I had to take it again. I uh, did much better. Uh, you always do really better when you take a course. I know it's just, yeah. I think it's just cause it's not fresh or it's also it's, repetition. Yeah. It's repetition, whatever. Uh, but I got a kick out of my professor. He was from Austria and he just, he, you know, uh, Austrians, their W's or V's. Yeah. So we got to eigenvalues and eigenvectors. I <laughs> lost it in class. So yeah, that was a, that was a fun experience. What village were you taking college in? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Cool. I went to an ABET accredited school, everybody. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so going back to the roller coasters, I just thought it would be a fun, fun uh, experiment to do with um, my kids and, you know, show them about physics. Uh, you know, I was planning it with them and we were talking about what we wanted. And we, you know, we had a couple times where we made changes uh, to the design. And one of them was we added a six foot section uh, of straight track, which, you know, no roller coaster really wants to have a section of straight track. Interesting. Uh, simply because it doesn't do anything, you know, you're not, you, you know, you're just traveling. It's like being in a car. It's not exciting. Yeah. Uh, so we did that specifically for the purpose of right behind it was going to be a hill. It's a negative G hill. So it's throwing you out about half a G. Oh, cool. And right at the end of that hill, you know, safely, safe distance away is a giant tree, like two foot in diameter tree. Yeah. So it literally thinks that, you know, you're coming over this hill and you're coming down and you're going, you know, on the straight track right into this tree. Oh, cool. And then it, it pops you up and you get thrown out and it, I mean, and then it banks away to the right. Oh, that's neat. And it, I mean, it really feels like, you know, you're going to get thrown out into that tree and I've, I've ridden it and oh my gosh, you know, you're just kind of <laughs> like, I'm a big guy. So when, <laughs> when it comes around, I'm just like, please tell me I designed this well enough. Please don't. <laughs> But I, I did, uh, you know, obviously do, uh, I did some, because test. I think those mass times acceleration, like you feel the same exact right. force relative to your body that your kid would feel. Exactly. Yeah, that's cool. As far as, yeah, I just weigh more. So it's, you know, uh, when it comes to roller coasters, there's nothing in terms of the actual mass other than the actual forces you impute to the roller coaster. Ride. That makes sense. So it's, as long as it's rated for the heaviest individual that's going to ride it, there you go. and you're going to feel the same thing no matter how big you are. Right. And I tested it many times before with one and a half times my weight in it. So nice. Uh, it's not coming off the track unless something spontaneously breaks. But yeah, it's so, been been a fun experience. That's for sure. That's cool. And all tax free. 
<laughs> but only if it's a legitimate business expense, which it is. It is. I have a, a course. course. You can go to mentorengineer.com well, and, and, and sign up for the course. And it's uh, it's a lot of fun. You should check it out. So, uh, yeah. Um, another video I really liked of yours was that Tay River video. Oh, uh, thanks. Yeah, no problem. So it was about a uh, failure of a railroad bridge in Scotland, I believe. It was Scotland. And if it's yeah. not Scottish, it's crap. Yeah. <laughs> so it says uh, Mike Myers. Yes. Well, so, uh, one of the funniest bits Master of all time. Character, but from the beginning. Yeah. So it's what it seemed like, right? What's that? I haven't seen the full bit, but it seemed like the character was like an early version of Fat Bastard from Austin Powers. It did, yeah. I mean, he's Scottish anyway, so he's I didn't he's always that. putting, you know, stuff like that. And uh, if you go, uh, what's it? So I married an axe murderer. He's Scottish in there, and um, he actually plays his dad, I think, too. And uh, he's playing his bagpipes and talking with a thick <laughs> Scottish accent. It's, it's just classic. I didn't realize he was actually Scottish. That's cool. I believe he's Scottish. I, I'm, I haven't looked it up. So. I know he's from the UK, but I guess he's done like a bunch of those different countries there. So right. in terms of his character development, because like Austin Powers is for sure British, right? So sure, yeah, yeah. Like Mike Myers says, right? I mean, I imagine if you grew up in that area, you might know all the accents. Yeah, travel. I'm not from that area, so I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, anyway. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the the bridge, so, I, I I took a causal look at it i mean it's it collapsed back in 1879 i believe so yeah. you know it's 140 years ago and kind of piecing back all you know first-hand information and what actually happened where were uh, you able to get that data like i'm just googling around or? uh just googling around and and looking at how uh you know people have put stuff together and then just looking at you know from an engineering perspective what do we do we do to you know solve the problems because you know the first problem you have is you have a train going across a bridge and you know cheers. oh yeah cheers in a category you know five essentially you know storm and you know the bridge collapses so yeah. you don't have the train going across or you don't have the bridge there or uh, you know the bridge hasn't collapsed you know you don't have a problem yeah you know if the bridge collapses and nobody's on the train going across it people are still alive and subsequently, if, you know, we just halted uh, transportation during Until that storm. Until the storm was over, then you would have been fine. Yeah. Right. So, you know, you look back and they didn't even I have. I you also mentioned it could have been a number of things that caused it. Like it wasn't definitive, the, the conclusion, right? Well, definitely. As, as engineers, we need to look into what actually causes things. And it's, it's rarely just one thing. Uh, if you remember the Exxon Valdez uh, oil spill back in... 1988 or something i didn't follow super closely but sure yeah me. but the, the thing was was oh the captain was drinking okay so yeah the captain was drinking it. ran the thing into a sandbar and oil spilled everywhere yeah but there wasn't like another person in the well the thing is you know do you actually expect the captain to be on duty 24 hours a day piloting the ship no you yeah, can't it, it's it's ridiculous so they went back and I'm kind of getting off topic here, but no, no, it's all right. I mean, I think you're, we're still in causal analysis. Sure. Right? We so. absolutely are. So I actually saw the causal map for this once. Yeah. And one of the things was, you know, well, why the hole break, you know, well, it wasn't a double hold ship. The loads were heavier or it wasn't designed for the loads that it saw, uh, you know, and the material wasn't strong enough. So, I mean, <laughs> and, the and each of those, the shipment also drinking? <laughs> he, well, they actually ended up clearing him because yeah. he actually wasn't on watch at that time. Oh, interesting. So the third person in charge was actually on watch. And uh, this will get to your heart. Uh, that was like the first real time that uh, navigation or computer navigation was, was done. Oh, interesting. So you yeah. normally had the cat or whoever's piloting the ship and your, uh, your navigator working as a team. Yeah. Well, in this case, it was are piloting the ship and a computer yeah that makes sense. so you know that was probably state of the art I mean, it was know. probably state of the art then we probably look back and be like yeah but i mean they're <laughs> thinking they're on star trek you know or, absolutely yeah. so when we when we design things like that we need to say okay you know when we're implementing new technology what kind of safeguards are we going to put in place to uh you know make sure that that's not doing too much yeah uh, at least for now uh, and they found other things like they couldn't make contact, radio contact with the shore because of right. uh, mountains and stuff like that. So you just didn't have, what is it, line of sight over the horizon? Something like that. I, I, I'd have to go back and look at that detail. Probably that wrong. Uh, but they also did it at night 
and there wasn't uh, enough buoys around. Uh, I mean, there was literally like it was a like, lot of like it was it was it, it was so the, the, it's easy. It looks like your outlook calendar right there. Yeah, I there's that up. I forgot about that. <laughs> but no, it's easy to just say, "Hey, the captain was drinking. What a scumbag!" You know, and right. like, blame the whole thing on that person. And I bet you, if you ask anybody about it today, what they remember, oh, the captain was drinking. Sure, that's all. That's the only thing. And he was fully cleared later. Jeez. Was that person even actually drinking? I mean, or was it just they needed... No, he, he, he was... They were in port, and he had a drink, and then came and they were in, in port. and knew he had to... A single drink, and then... And that was I don't know if it was a single or multiple, yeah. but either way, he relieved himself of his duties Yeah. as the, the captain going out of port, so... So he wasn't actually piloting... He wasn't, he wasn't anywhere near it. And, oh, jeez. You know, it wasn't against company policy or anything of that nature... So they just need a scapegoat, basically. They just blame that person. Absolutely. The court just looked because there's trolleys in this part of town. Oh, is that what that was? Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> like, and it's right there. <laughs> we got we got battery backups on everything because it causes dirty power. Oh, yeah. really? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Yeah, no, that's interesting, though. I mean, I, I feel like it's um, it's often that, you know, kind of the root cause of something gets simplified or... You gotta sell a story, or you want to absolve yourself of liability as a company, so you gotta blame one person. Like, and was... I think a lot of people do it for PR reasons. Yeah, well, I mean, wasn't there an event recently with um, Uber Advanced Technology Group and Google? I, I don't know the ins and outs of this, although I should, given my industry. But there was one uh, gentleman whose name I'm, I'm blanking on, who apparently stole a whole bunch of trade secrets from Google and then went to Uber. When Uber sued Google, they were just like, it was all that guy, you know, or, or sorry, when Google sued Uber, just like, it was mm. all that guy, you know, and so. And yeah. I mean, put him up to it, he didn't get paid to do it, like, none of that. Sadly, know? that is the world we live in, where yeah. everybody just wants to point a finger when, you know, you know it. And I, I don't know, know the ins and outs of the story, I'm just speculating, yeah. but it seems like, the, you know, it's probably. And it's it's really hard to, you know, collaborate. <gasps> Look at that. Collaborative with Spencer Crafts. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, it's really hard to do that when, you know, everybody's just ready to point fingers at somebody else not screwing up rather than, you know, having the desire to be a, a team and coming to a solution and it's all been problems. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, um, yeah, it really comes down to just when, when push comes to shove and things go wrong, you know, it's, we live in such a litigious society. I mean, I hate to, to talk smack, you know, but what it is so. it is what it is right yeah exactly and it isn't what it isn't <laughs> i wish it wasn't spencer yeah no me as well um i remember coming home from work uh, a few years ago and um well, this would have been like six years ago and uh, i was pulling up to a blind intersection i couldn't see left or right and um sorry left or right <laughs> and uh, <laughs> basically um you know i just is inching up and as i finally got up to the the street this guy came and leaned on his horn and hit my car. I think he had been waiting there. And <laughs> I, I said, oh, my God, are you okay? You know, like, can I help you? I don't want to talk to you. And the guy started calling the police immediately. Right. Well, long story short, the guy sued my insurance policy for every penny he had for personal injury. Oh, wow. He had his whole family in the car. He had two kids and, you know, a wife or a girlfriend. And, um, you know, first he sued for the 12-year-old, and that was like a domino effect. That legitimized the other suits. Nobody was hurt. They were all walking around. The police right. even said, your vehicle is fine. Why don't you just drive home? He's like, I want to have it towed, you know? And yeah. So, I mean, it's, I don't know. It's people like that that make it so expensive for the rest of us to get insurance. If only they worked that hard in every other aspect That's of their it, life, right? right? And so, I mean, I saw the guys, like my, my lawyer that the insurance company assigned me, showed me the guy's case record. And what she had said to me is, usually this looks like an empty middle of holder. This guy's was a phone book. So really? he was a professional. So these are all previous cases that he's filed suit on? Correct. So this guy made his living suing people. So I ran into one of those. So Right. Yeah. Or he ran into you. Yeah, he ran into me. But I he technically had the right away, so Yeah, absolutely. He, he knew what he was doing. He was professional. Mm -hmm. Although there's money to be made, there'll be there'll be people making it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's gotta be some other funny industries like that that exist that like I mean, you know, they totally need to, I mean, but they probably wouldn't need to if the system was a little bit different. So, like, have you ever applied for government grant? No. So, it's I've applied for two uh, through my company I work with now, SKA. And um, I remember um, the first time we did it, um, we wanted to build a device that would, uh, like an anti-drone device. So, something for airports and, and no-fly zones to have that would 
use a laser beam or a, a high-powered radar to, to essentially burn a drone out of the sky and track it with cameras was, was our approach. And I didn't really know anything about government grants, so I, I had just assumed that if we had this great idea and we went to the government, they would give us a grant for it. It's not really how it works at all. No, I can't <laughs> imagine it does. No, no, no. And so it turns out you know, they, they put out bids for what they actually want, and you've got to respond to one of those, which I didn't know that. And so we spent a lot of hours trying to prove out a concept and all this stuff. And I, I got, you know, probably like half a dozen people to work on this thing. And of course, we didn't get it because we you know, didn't know how to play the game. Right. And so it anyway, was the you, game, I'm sure. You, you think I learned my lesson, but then I applied again for another one. Somebody sent me this link, uh, actually an SKA client. Um, they said, hey, you should apply for this. And it was, it was a, they wanted a vehicle to carry material for it's the Army or the Marines. But it was, it was a small vehicle for hiking trails. And the idea was, um, you know, we have these uh, SMETs, so it's a uh, material equipment transport. I probably had that wrong, but there's it's some acronym that means it's a vehicle that carries stuff, mm -hmm. and it's it's very large. Uh, it looks like an armored personnel carrier, and um, there's no way it's fitting on, you know, like through a doorway or like into like an urban environment or you know on a narrow path. And so they wanted a smaller version of it, basically. And so right. we had a robot that we're talking about, like. 20 inches wide or something. Yeah, the exact size of that track vehicle I showed you in my living room. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> tiny, yeah. And so we took pictures of that vehicle with, with a certain payload mounted. Um, one of my friends uh, who was in Iraq and Afghanistan, just I, I asked if I could borrow one of his uniforms. He said, just keep them, I'm done with them. You know, and so <laughs> gave me his combat fatigues. I had another friend from Palestine who posed in the combat fatigues. Um, and we took a bunch of pictures of him and the robot just so that, you know, nobody would have to use their imagination to realize we already, and all they were asking for was CAD models. And we're like, here's a physical robot mm -hmm. for the person. And we forgot to take a box on like a form. And, you know, they have like, you know, a dozen supplemental forms you have to fill out. And so we, we didn't even qualify. I think they, they made it so people couldn't view ours, the DOD. Oh, and, man. I just stopped applying after that. I would too, yeah. you know, if there's, there's a, a limit of, you know, paperwork is good. Yeah. yeah, it's nice to have a paper trail here and there, but contract, when you use it yeah. as something that's, you know, basically a tool to prevent somebody from helping you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and there and there could have been politics I didn't know at play. Like it could have been that there was a company that had already been, you know, sort of promised that contract, and they just had to put it to bid for semantic reasons. Which I mean, I don't know. I can't be too mad at that, you know. But the same joke. I mean, I just think it speaks to uh, a broken system, but. There's people that make good money um, navigating those waters, and, and rightfully so. I mean, if, if I were to do it again, which right. I probably won't, um, I would definitely hire a professional Absolutely. To, to write the grants. And that's that's one of the things is, you know, we need to we need to see as we run our businesses, we need to exchange value for value and not just look at it in terms of dollars. You know, if you had paid the right person $2,000 to get that job and yeah. check that box that they know about and you don't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, would that exactly. have been worth it to you? Uh, I, I mean, if we had been awarded, sure. Yeah. And it's about, I think it's a one in seven award rate. So companies that are really good at it, I've, I've, I've heard as good as 35%. We had Jorgen Pedersen from RE Squared, which is a um, a grant factory. I mean, they, they get so many government grants. They can get like 30 and change percent of the ones that apply. Wow. For, which is really good. I mean, when you consider one in seven is the average. And then we have another client who is, um, or sorry, I should say we have a client who is, um, they make lightweight structures for the military and they get about 25%, so one in four of the ones they apply for. Mm -hmm. So but that's also considered very good. Yeah, I don't know. Absolutely. If you do it all day and all night, you can you can beat the average. Workers. But you're still, I mean, you know, but, but one yeah, degree I mean, is about the best you're going to get. But for, you know, smaller companies, you know, spending the money to get, you know, that professional, yeah, and with a one in seven chance. Well, so know, here's that, the thing. I have to after you, sir. Oh, okay. That just isn't practical in some applications. That could be, you know, taking out another loan that you really can't pay back, or yeah. And yeah. if it doesn't go, then. Well, I think the smart move would be, and like, if you wanted to be a grant factory, and and I've sort of hints. I, I enjoy private sector work so much. I don't think I'd ever want to do this because I, I like working on you know, biomedical devices. I, I'm kind of a capitalism fanboy. I mean, I really enjoy you know our, the free market and the way things like that work. And so I, I don't think I'd want to give that up to just purely work on government grants. Right. But if you know, 
somebody said, you know, the name of the game is to get government grants as many as you can get. I think the way to do it would be to um, to take a loan for you know a couple hundred thousand dollars, hire two full time administrators, and just go for volume. So you know, like absolutely, a, a dozen, I think that's how you have year. to do it. Yeah, so yeah. one out of seven, who cares? You know, as long yeah, as yeah, a dozen a year, you're probably gonna get two, and so maybe three or four. And so you just play the numbers, and you know, you you try to you try to get. I mean, I think that's the only way you can succeed at that game. But I think if you if you do it that way, the numbers make sense and, and it becomes financially viable. Right. Yeah. Now earlier you used that C word, capitalism. Now I, I know you know I don't want to get political, but the interesting thing about um, capitalism is you know if you have five dollars in your wallet, that's capital, and that's what you know that's how I do business with somebody else because you know not many people need my services you know but I need to eat three times a day so. We need to exchange that. Anyway, I say this because when I, as a capitalist, when I make a product, I sell a service, I have to make sure somebody else wants that. Uh, and if they don't want that, then, you know, I'm going to be hungry. And so for me to make any money, I have to look outside of myself to make that. And I, you know, I have to consider, you know, what what Spencer's needs and how can I help him accomplish a problem he's got or whatever, so that you know, I can make money from him. Uh, you know, socialism, communism, whatever. On the other hand, you know, is it's generally focused on what is the government giving me, and not considering, you know, what am I offering to the government for that service? Yeah. So you know, it's it's really. It's really an interesting way of of seeing it, and I'm seeing it more and more being on the small business side as a business owner than I did before, where you know I just kind of like I showed up for work, I did work, they paid me. Yeah, it's a totally different it, set of motivations. And now you know I have you know skin in the game. I, I take risks. Uh, they're calculated risks, but you know some have paid off, some have flopped. Oh my god! <laughs> I released a course last I year. Man. I sold five of for a grand total of I think two hundred dollars, and I literally spent like two hundred hours on this project. Wow! It's a buck an so hour. A buck an hour. Woo! It's like sweatshop that, wages. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, I, I learned a lot from that, and I won't be doing anything quite like that again. So. Yeah, no, I I know what you mean, and I've probably said this on the podcast before, so I apologize for the repetition, but I keep a journal of mistakes and lessons learned. So if I if I screw up in some way, I, I write it down. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes I'm very confused when it happens. And so it's just kind of an outlet. It's, it's a way to dump angst and frustration and, you know, just, you know, you want to, you want to holler. Right. And so you just, you write it all down. You're like, okay, now that's kind of off my chest. And then you start to process it. You're like, well, what lessons can I extrapolate from that? And so Absolutely. That's the, that's the meaty part that kind of pays me back later. So I have a whole other list at the top of the document. Um, and then journal entries at the bottom. And then every time I write a journal entry, I'll go through the list. I'll be like, you know, have I repeated a mistake? Because one way that I feel um, is that I don't mind making a mistake so long as I don't repeat it. And I mean, you know, every now and then, you know, you forget a thing and, and it happens. Of course, yeah. you, you try not to. And so, first of all, I'll look at the list. I'll be like, did I, did I foul up in, in a way where I did one of these things that I told myself I wouldn't do again? And you know, sometimes it's the case, usually it isn't. And so what I'll do is I'll add new bullet points to the list that sort of, I try not to keep it, I think it's got like 20, 30 bullet points on it. So it's a little longer than it should be. But, yeah, uh, if you're getting real detailed, you know, you kind of have to, you know, you got to keep them general, I think, to make sure that, you know, when are you ever going to find yourself in exactly that position again, but you're going to find yourself in a similar think. position. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I, I probably need to start doing that. Abstract away. I mean, definitely the more universal it becomes. But I, I don't know. It's a work in progress. Absolutely, but it's good that you're doing that. I, I'll right. probably start doing that. Yeah, I, please. Now, interestingly enough. enough, for the last, I'll say at least ten years, I've had a goal, written down goal, of failing at least once a day. And actually. Actually. Cool. I could show it to How'd you. How'd you fail today? Uh, I don't know. Um, yeah. hmm. I don't know, but. It, you know, it's just a general thing. Like, uh, I want to welcome failure as a learning tool. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't enjoy failing. I don't think anybody does. Yeah. But the the more you know, I'm open to it. When failure does happen, uh, you know, it's just not as big of a deal. Uh, I'll say, you know, yesterday I was doing some work on my car, and I'm not at home. I'm on vacation, 
Uh, I had to replace the spark plug, and I got a spark plug. This was yesterday? This was yesterday. You told me to start. Or, or, sorry, two days ago. Yeah. Um, spark plug uh, socket. And I was in such a hurry at the store that I bought a half-inch drive deep socket instead right. of a three-eighths. So you couldn't so, fit it onto your socket. So I, I went home because I had to reach over the engine to get the back three spark plugs. Yeah. And I, I, I need to let the engine cool. So I got the engine to completely <laughs> cool and then found this out. Uh, when in the store, I should have just plugged them all together and made sure they worked, you know, five seconds. Yeah. That's but now I had to borrow, I had to, yeah, we were at somebody's house. So that's an easy lesson to extrapolate, right? Like, you know, right. And it doesn't have to be anything huge, but it did cause some inconvenience. And I was out there as the sun is going down, you know, it's getting darker and darker. I've been there. Well, so I have that carport I showed you and I've got, um, floodlights in there just for working on the car when it gets, cause there's so many times. I mean, I put, I put that carport up probably at like four in the morning. Oh yeah? Well, what? and then I, I didn't bolt it into the ground because I didn't want to annoy the neighbors with the impact, uh, or the SDS drill. And so I waited till 7 a.m. And then I drilled all the holes and bolted it in mm -hmm. with the caps. And you didn't come out and it was flipped over or nothing, right? Well, I mean, yeah, luckily it wasn't a windy day. The weather was good. And so yeah. I got, I got my three hours of sleep and then I went and installed it the rest of the way. Yeah, there you go. So. You couldn't have waited for the next day. I just wanted to get it done. I was, cool. I was in one of those modes where, you know, it's just, it's just a job to be done. I'm going to finish it. Even if it's not an important job, it's putting in a carport. You know? <laughs> but definitely open, open yourself up for failure. Uh, you know, learn from it. That's the best way to learn because once you get burned and it hurts, you know, you're not going to do that mistake again. Well, I think it's important to look at it that way because it's, it's easy to get burned and it hurts. And, you know, all of a sudden you just don't want to leave the house. Much better is, is what you said, which is, right. you know, just leave the house, but don't, you know, put your hand on that fire. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so. Now, I, I had a, I have a 10 year old daughter. She was uh, probably five at the time. But we, we, you know, you tell your kids not to touch the stove. Yeah. And um, we hear the scream from inside the kitchen when oh, she no. went back to get something. And we know she touched the stove. It's not. She's not like repeating a that mistake, though. Right. And we're like, Megan, did you touch the stove? I touched nothing. Megan, did you touch the stove? <laughs> I touched nothing. <laughs> Show us your fingers. She shows us the other hand, of course. <laughs> Show us your other hand. Obviously, all the fingers are burnt. <laughs> and she's like, I don't want to get in trouble. And we're like, you're not in trouble. You you already had the consequence of, <laughs> of what you, you know what we told you not to do. Uh, now yeah, you know, yeah. but you know. I normally wouldn't weigh in on this, but that sounds like really good parenting. <laughs> uh, they're gonna do it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I don't know. When I would screw up as a kid, I remember my parents always they had to punish me additionally. It's a thing I and I'd be like, I've already been punished. Right, my exactly. Life. You know, like, you know, I've thought about that when, up. you know, when parents screw up and their, you know, the children die or, you know, some freak accident, but yeah. you know, it was definitely, they were, you know, the cause for them. Like, and then you have legal punishments on top of that. I'm like, dude, they're living with that every day. Yeah. You know, there's no way that they're going to escape it or forget about it for a moment. You know, don't punish them. Yeah. Well, unless they're total sociopaths, but that's not the, that's not the rule. That's Most the of the time is not the case. Yeah, you, know, yeah, you, you hear about accidents that are totally preventable, that whatever. Yeah, no, I'm with you on that. So yeah, um, how does that apply to your work as an engineer? What are, what are some of the things you've learned on the job that have kind of helped you to, to, I guess, you know, not repeat mistakes, to be more efficient with your time, to, you know, to... Yeah, that's, that's, your that's good. And your rank as an engineer? That's a really good question. Right. Uh, I'll have to think about that for a couple seconds before I really start talking. Okay. Um, you know, as, as a, a consultant, I really value my customers money and you know generally speaking they're more concerned about the money than the time that is wasted uh just because you know it's an expense that they're seeing um so that's one of the reasons why i quote most things as fixed costs because i'm going to be a partner with you to solve a specific problem rather than just an hourly employee who doesn't really care if you accomplish your goals or not you know i want to make sure that i'm involved you know, so the first thing is, I think, just involvement. You know, you're being committed to coming up with a solution, uh, and then make sure you know, do your due due, due diligence. Uh, twice in my engineering career, 
I, if I would ran a five minute calculation, maybe even that might be generous actually. Yeah. Uh, I could have saved tons of time and money uh, by not applying a product that I thought was adequate for the job, but clearly wasn't. Been there as well. You know, when you, uh, one of them was a uh, hydraulic uh, or a, a gearbox for rotation of the aerial unit. And it's rated for 10,000 inch pounds. And when, you, when you say area unit, just like aerial. Aerial. Right, sorry. Yeah. So uh, people that go play with power lines, the power trucks, you know, get the rotation bearing, you know, crane rotation bearing. So the thing that makes it turn around on the base. Absolutely. The so there's a gearbox there that interfaces with the rotation bearing. And this thing was rated, I want to say, like 10,000 inch pounds. And we were putting like 22,000 on it. And. <laughs> Of course it broke. And then wondering why all the bolts are breaking that hold it to the, to the, the turntable. Yeah. That makes but, sense. you know, a five-minute calculation would have said, oh, I used to need to use the next size one up. So, yeah. you know, we spent uh, thousands of hours and probably burned eight to ten weeks, you know, just not having that right. So at least a million dollars, maybe. Or... I don't know if it, was a, it definitely <laughs> wasn't a million dollars. But, you know, it's it's time and money. Yeah. And nobody likes to get in those situations, but you know, you just gotta, you gotta definitely do your due diligence from, I'm just pulling numbers on my rear Yes. I, I love doing hand calculations. So if you ever need somebody to show you how to do hand calculations, come reach out to me. There's a lot to be said for that. I feel like a lot of people are really quick to reach for CAD and inappropriate. Especially the FBA. Yeah. The finite element analysis. So what was that exactly for the lay people out there that will listen? Yeah. So finite element analysis is basically the application of Hooke's law on a, uh, big scale. Hooke's law is how a spring behaves. So you got your coils on your spring, just an extension, exp uh, extension spring and you pull it and you know, it takes a certain amount of force at each, uh, increment. You know, if you've stopped it, you know, 10th of an inch and 20th of an inch, you know, and kept stretching. Although those numbers are backwards. It's a big time. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 and measured the force. Uh, we know how that material react. Well, if we break down a object, whether it's just a single piece or a weldment, uh, something of that nature, and uh, break all that down into little springs, uh, we can measure how much it stretches as we apply uh, loads, torques, uh, whatever pressures uh, to that, those mesh that what we call a mesh, and it's the, all these things are linked together now in a big, a giant linear algebra problem. There you go, Spencer, <laughs> cool. put that back in there. Not very good. And at that. the there's a couple of different methods of trying to solve it. One is you actually flip the matrix, which when you have you know four million nodes, four million equations, Sounds that like gets a little tedious. Yeah. Uh, so most people. Uh, when they do FEA, they try to iteratively solve it. So they'll add, you know, essentially like one pound and try to figure out how everything equals out. And they, it, I don't know how it does it exactly, but it iterates to a solution rather than trying to solve a solution. But I'm guessing it still takes a bit of time to run that, that calculation. Absolutely. Um, so it depends on how complex your object is, but uh, my basic rule of thumb is I will do hand calculations first. And then I will go back and do FEA. And if my FEA doesn't match what I expect in hand calculations, I go back and revise the hand calculations. Uh, if I don't do that, I find myself in this cycle, you know, an iteration of FEA takes 20 minutes, you know, to just to run, it probably takes 30 to 40 every time I run it. Uh, and I may be able to go in and do a Where's hand calculation. Where's the extra 10 to 20 minutes coming from? Just, uh, well, I got to see the previous result. I've Setting gotta, it up. Huh? Setting it up. Setting it up. Yeah. I, I, well, you know, it spits out this pretty picture of, you know, different, you know, colors. And if it's hot in one area, I want to say like, okay, maybe I want to do this. And I got to, you know, go remodel it. And then I'll remesh it and rerun it and see if there's any difference. So, you know, I'd say most FEAs, can be done in 20 minutes but if you're you know well like i did look at a whole aerial lift you're looking at you know 16 to 20 hours of runtime <laughs> and fea gets really slow at that point so i make sure that every time i i do an fea i go back and do the hand calculation and I, this is why i'm 
you know, I love hand calculations because I've been doing it for so long. It's kind of a natural process to me, but I've not been, not done that. Let me see. I've not done that process where I go back and check the, F, uh, the hand calcs and I've run FEA and just changed a little bit, changed a little bit, changed a little bit. I'm not anywhere near to the solution and I've wasted, you know, one, two, three days, sometimes a week. And I do a five minute hand calculation. I'm like, oh, this is way not strong enough at all. Yeah. And it's like a sanity check almost. Absolutely. I mean, it's a sanity check. You know, a lot of great equipment has been designed without the use of FEA. Space shuttle. I mean, maybe not the space, space shuttle. shuttle. Yeah. I, I don't know how much FEA they had. Yeah. But it was, it was designed in the 80s, right? I think. Uh, I think the first flight was in 81. Okay. So it would have been designed in the 70s. Yeah, it absolutely would. Yeah, there's no FEA. Th there was some FEA, but it was. The Saturn V rocket then. Right, yeah, Saturn V rocket. I mean, it landed a guy on the moon. So, yeah, um, FEA back in the 1970s would have been more like you know, looking at the bridges around here, got it, and doing like big point to point connections, yeah, and not looking at the riveted joints, joiner plates, that kind of stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. So, there's there's a you know, a lot of improvement. Uh, the other problems with FEA is you have the issues of singularity. So, when you have you know, like two plates butted up next to each other and you put a weld in there, well, you've got a sharp transition twice because it's you know, theoretically a 45 degree up on the weld and then up on the plate. And right where those two meet, uh, mathematically, it doesn't like that. So that depending on how that's big- like gimbal lock a little bit? Gimbal, uh... So that's when you've got ambiguity as to, you've got an Euler angle for a gimbal on a robotic system and there's ambiguity as to which angle it's at. Sometimes when you oh, I got gotcha. you. Uh, so especially when it's extended outward, and it could it be kind of is. I mean, go roll is the same as yaw, I think, and that's that's why it gets weird. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that's exactly the same thing. Okay. I think it's just mathematically when you get your little springs and you got two pieces meeting here, and you got one going here, one going here, going there, and you really have nothing to balance those out by the way i might have that wrong i'm not great at that kind of math so send all hate mail to podcast OSK about solutions nice <laughs> anyway uh uh depending on your mesh size if your mesh is rather large you can get that number to read smaller indicating that you might miss something uh, and then you know you have a hot spot and you're not picking up on it so it's not registering and then if you can go the opposite way where if you keep making it smaller, you get higher and higher and higher and higher stresses. And at some point you have to say, well, what is the actual stress? And the answer is you really don't know. You know, you can do hand calculations and find out pretty close to what it is. That's cool. So a lot of times that will save you when you have those singularity issues. Now I've also seen people use uh, FEA and they'll be like, oh, I've got a singularity issue there. I'll make my mess smaller or mess uh, bigger so that it won't show up and nobody will catch me on it. And I'm uh, just like, yeah. you know, I just find that highly unethical and I know it happens all the time. Yeah. That's, so basically what happens is the computer misses the issue. Yep. It just, it just it misses has granularity. It. Yeah, that makes sense. Now it's, uh, that does strike me as dishonest. It does. And yeah. I know, I know lots of people who have done it to, uh, well, I think, I mean, I, I don't, I haven't actually done any FEA, if you can't tell from the way I'm talking. No, I, I, I don't know. But I had no idea. It's probably, it's, it's probably good from a perspective. I can't be an expert in everything. It's probably That's just, right. I, I, thank yeah. God I am not an expert in anything. <laughs> but but what, I, what I have that's kind of similar from my, my past experiences, I used to be a research programmer. And there were times when I would get stuck on trying to solve a particular problem. And I wouldn't be patient enough. So this was when I was a student. It was really early in my career. And I wouldn't be patient enough to, to go through and think about it analytically. And so to say, the way that I got to this line of code is I did this, then I did this, then I did that. Um, and, you know, this number should therefore be this based on all the steps I've taken. Instead, and this is a common rookie mistake. I'm not the only one that's ever made this mistake. Far from it. Um, you would hack at it. You try to change it a little bit and hope it works. And a little bit more, a little bit more. Right. And, and the more you try to do that, Oftentimes, the more you break your computer program in, in a way where you don't understand it anymore, and now you're really in the weeds. All right. And so it's Back up like, seven versions ago. Yeah. <laughs> and then you have to do the, the you know, the uh, algorithms in your head anyway or on paper. 
And so I, I feel like that's similar to what you're describing. It is. I mean, you know, it's always easier if you know what you're doing. You come at it from a perspective of, I know that this shape is generally strong enough to handle the loads. And then we're going to model it and check it uh, rather than it's the design. Um, I actually have a, uh, a weldment design course out that just launched this week. Oh, cool. Um, that goes through a lot of this and, you know, exposes a little bit more my, my view of FEA and how, you know, you can, you know, do simple things to change it. That's awesome. How can people get that course? Is it a paid course? Uh, yeah, you can go to mentoredengineer.com and click the products link and you'll see it right there. Nice. And when someone takes that, do they get a credential? Do they get the knowledge? Uh, they definitely get the knowledge. That's the most important part. Yeah, I um, agree. But sometimes it's hard to show that, right? So Absolutely. I'm asking. So, uh, yes, on top of that, uh, if you're, well, you get uh, six and a half uh, PDHs. It's a pretty lengthy course, but it's an online, you know, go at your own pace uh, course taught by me and another uh, professional engineer. And uh, we had a great time putting it together, that's for sure. That's awesome. uh, I actually learned a lot or just kind of remembered a lot of stuff that I hadn't used in a while. So this sounds incredibly valuable. I mean, what you get Absolutely. Use... Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it, I, I probably spent, you know, 300 hours putting it together between all the recordings and you know, making sure I'm saying the right things and double checking everything that I'm about to say. Written articles like that, where it's, you just spend so much time triple checking because you don't want to be wrong. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> There's one thing I like about the podcast format that we're doing now is, you know, I'm just like, I'm probably wrong on this, but here's an idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I apologize. Uh, apologize in advance. Yeah. yeah. No, I hear you, uh, and everybody but, loves to be the cr critic, which... But there's also something to be said for what you're describing, which is going in and vetting it in advance. Absolutely, because right, I can't be but... teaching a whole bunch of people something that's well, yeah, wrong exactly. or I'm not sure of. That would be unethical. Uh, you know, I, I really spent... There was a, a several sections of the course where I had to pretty much go back in and, and prove everything I knew or I, I'd known and used, but prove it to myself that this is how it's done. Uh, especially with uh, weld fatigue and weld fatigue uh, for those of you who don't know uh, fatigue is when you apply loads cyclically you know either uh, push pull or uh, so it's like, like a rotation bending you've been bending over and over again? absolutely the paperclip thing yeah uh, and that that was a study of engineering that started with the railroad industry and they noticed that their their boxcar axles would break after a certain you know length of time in service and they could almost pinpoint it like exactly how much it was used and That's how many miles that it had been on. And they're they like, had the data to, to back that up. Oh, I'm sure a lot of it was hearsay, but yeah. you know, a lot of uh, Midwestern universities were really big into fatigue study because of the railroad. That's cool. So um, they found out that fatigue for, you know, what we call parent material, you know, just a plain bar of steel is a lot different once it's been welded. And uh, the so, method. So you've been heat treating it, basically. You've so. absolutely been heat treating, and when you when you heat it, you know it's it's at uh, several thousand degrees. Yeah. And then it cools, and it actually, you know, if you have uh, like a T joint, and you weld it on both sides, once it cools, uh, it'll curve the bottom on up the bottom plate. Yeah. And that actually means that it's it's bent it, so it's it's permanent deformation. No. And you're, you have residual stresses at yield in your weld. And then when you say residual stresses at yield, that means that when it, that means you've yielded the material somewhat, but not all the way, or what, what does that exactly mean? Yes, exactly. It hasn't been yielded all the way, but there's still stress in there. Um, I'm trying to think of what I... So you've what, broken it at points in the weld, but the other parts aren't broken yet. So therefore it's residual. Right. I mean, I just want to make sure I'm correct here. I, I think that's right. Yeah. I'm trying to think of a good example that's, you know, kind of hands-on that everybody would understand. Sure. Um, this may work. Okay. I mean, Do you remember the old Stretch Armstrong dolls? Uh, Where you could stretch it out. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like the Nickelodeon. Right. The Nickelodeon. And then, uh, you know, you'd let it go and it snap back together. But it that's would take cool. a long time to do that. Yeah. Uh, so that would be a residual stress as it's getting from this position to where it wants to be. Yeah. So yeah, that, that would be 
uh, best example I can give of uh, residual stress. I mean, you could probably break those if you pull them. I'm, I'm absolutely everything has got a limit. Yeah. So hence yielding. Yeah, hence yielding. Cool. So yeah, it's been fun to put that course together, and uh, so far it's been selling pretty good. So I'm excited nice. about that. Is it? Do you find you mostly a repeat business? Like, who are most of your customers? Uh, a lot of repeat business because that that one course that I released uh, last year that went nowhere and I made a dollar an hour. Uh, three of those people have already signed up for this one. Nice. So I was excited about that. So obviously I'm doing something right. Well, I feel like with a lot of this stuff, it just takes time to build traction. I mean, that's it does definitely been true with uh, you know, I mean, the podcast for sure. Just to get meta with it for a second. Yeah. I mean, many more people watch. You know, viewership goes up the more these we release. Um, it's been true with SKA. I mean, you know, like the more successes we get under our belt, the more people hire us. Um, it is a, a tough road when you're starting off doing anything. A friend of mine said that, uh, you know, it's amazing when you start a business, there's nobody waiting to give you money. <laughs> you have to go out there and, and really earn well, it. People really want their problem solved, though, right? They do. They want their problem solved. And if you can talk to them in the, the the method of, you know, how can I solve what your problem actually is? I find a lot of uh, clients or potential clients come to me and they say, we just want you to do this, but they don't tell you what their problem is. And maybe there's a better way of solving their problem that they aren't aware of. I'm with you on that. We've, you know, we've experienced that too. And so, I mean, often, yeah, exactly. It, it, you see a lot with defense clients. I feel like you see a lot with um, other industries are like that. Um, I mean, we've seen it in, in all sorts of, I guess, like, we've seen it in medical stuff where people don't want you to know what they're doing, so they won't tell you the full problem. Right. Um, let's see, where else have I experienced that? Um, consumer goods. I mean, I think it comes down to culture. So I think it's I think it's a cultural issue. So a lot of people, you know, I mean, they think James Bond needs to know basis, right? And so you don't need to know that. Therefore, I'm only going to tell you right. a small piece of the puzzle. But what they're cheating themselves out of when they do that is, you know, getting at your mental horsepower. That's right. You know, or, or, you know, maybe me as a, as a product manager, I know, you know, resources that would be better suited to solving the problem if I knew what the full problem was. But, you know, if they only give me a small piece of the puzzle, I can only be so useful. Right. And that's how I feel, you know, hourly billing is. It's like, you want me to solve this problem. So this, this part of the puzzle, I don't see what the whole puzzle is. I've actually switched and over. I just, I just keep going. It's not this piece, not this piece, not this piece, not the, oh, finally this piece. And it's a guessing game. It's not yeah. uh, mentally. But do you think that's any different than when you're billing flat rate? I mean, I think it's just an issue of where the risk is. Because I've, I've actually switched over SKA's billing structure entirely to hourly. Oh. In my time here. No, yeah, it's all right. Well, I mean, we might not even talk about that. No, no, we, we can talk about it. So. No, um, I, for, and it depends on the size of the project. The reason it's worked for us, um, and, and I, I'm, sounds like you've had different experiences is because there's there's still a sense of integrity and, and of reputation and if we waste the client's money on a lot of rabbit holes that don't make any sense for them um then we're not going to have that client very long and and true we even encourage our clients to get rid of us if we're not doing a good job of solving their problems but when we used to do fixed flat rate like consistently and that is how we got our start um what would happen is oftentimes you you get you know, clients, and, and this is not, you know, everybody, but, you know, as a young company, I think this happens more often than not. You get clients that would try to see how much they could get out of you, or, you know, like, can we scope this problem purposely, vaguely, and then get, like, a free extra iteration? Right, and, yeah. And so you call it scope creep, right? And so... Yeah, you got to be, that's that's the number one detriment of the flat fee is scope creep. So we, but we you, need to, you need to, you know... How do you handle that? Uh, so it depends on the project. So if, if I can, uh, I say, see the beginning from the end. Yeah. Or see the end from the beginning. That's what it is. See the yeah, end from the beginning. Right. Yeah. And, you know, it's a, you know, we're going to do this and this and this. And it's obviously logical that we're going to go in this way. Uh, you know, it's a lot easier to see that. And you can come up with a well-defined, narrow scope. And then when things start popping up, like, could it also do this? Well, you know, let me submit a quote for you for that. And uh, I don't have much, I haven't had much uh, experience with that part. But from what I've heard is a lot of people, once you say, I'll submit a quote for uh, a, a bid for that, they kind of just not be like, ah, oh, I'm not interested. You know, 
and they, yeah. they move on. So you've never had a client try to take advantage and, and get like a free extra feature out of you or? Most of the time it is, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll pad in and like something is going to go free and I'll, yeah. I'll have a, a firm, you know, for me in, internal, you know, set of, of how much scope creep could I tolerate in this? That way it's not like I'm nickel and diming them for everything. And then, but I've, I've planned in that, you know, one or two things would happen that would yeah. be of a certain magnitude. And if it gets above that, then we say, okay, we need to talk about our scope and, you know, submit or re renegotiate this. The way I used to handle that when I was writing SKA scopes for flat rate projects is I'd say, you know, there's one free change order included with this project. Sure. Yeah. And so that, that seemed to work well. Um, but again, I mean, there's so much upfront cost scoping things surgically, um, to, to scoping them in a way where, you know, the, there's no back door to end up. Maybe this is, you know, me not being trusting enough. I'm not sure exactly. Right. I, I tend to be pretty trusting. Yeah. You know, I want, I want things to go well and I want them to be happy at the end of the day. I want everyone to be happy. Um, works for me. You know, but if I have a clear goal and I have a clear paycheck, I'm not prone to going down the rabbit holes of wasting people's time and money and just I've doing what they ask them to. to do that, which I consider to be very unethical. Um, Absolutely. And... That definitely is. And the problem is, is that they're motivated by the payment schedule to do that. Yeah. And I, I guess I could see things getting off the rails in that way, but I mean, there's gotta be a middle ground, right? So the way I look at it is at least with time and materials work, the client always has the option of firing the contractor. Sure. The contractor has a reputation to worry about. If they waste time and resources and go in circles intentionally just to run down the clock and accrue additional billable hours, people are going to, I mean, that's going to get around, you know, people talk mm -hmm. to each other, you know, and, you know, furthermore, I mean, there's such a thing as having integrity and ethics and, you know, absolutely wanting to do right by people without getting hurt yourself. And so, Honestly, I think it's better for the client as well. Uh, one of the first jobs I did uh, got to the end of the or near the end of the project, and there was just this definite ominous of "We want you out of here." And I'm yeah. like, "There's a whole bunch of stuff you still haven't you know, haven't gotten to that you want." That's happened with with, with uh, and it happens, and I I just I really don't like that the, you know that feeling where if I you know I've done my job. And I've delivered the project. I want to see it through to the end and make sure it's, it is doing what they wanted me to do in the beginning. Yeah. And they don't have to be worried about how many hours is this costing us. You know, they've already paid the money. So the way that I sometimes handle that, and this is a bit of a middle ground, and I don't know that I've ever said this publicly, but I mean, I think everybody does this, that bills time and materials um, is we'll oftentimes throw in a bunch of free hours, like especially toward the end of a product to, to make handoff go smoothly. Or if something goes wrong, you know, and, and you know, maybe, you know, I'm a little bit at fault or, or one of the people under my command screwed up. I mean, you know, oftentimes I'll cover the cost of fixing it, you know, so like mm -hmm. you, you'll bring in another resource and you'll train them up for free and then you'll replace the resource that wasn't really pulling their own weight. And, you know, then you'll tell the client, like, look, you know, we're sorry we screwed up here, but we've covered the cost of training for the new resource and we've replaced the faulty link. Right. And, it's not and I think that's again. just generally good things that you should be doing. And yeah. that should be, you know, every problem, every project screws up somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and you can almost count on one major and maybe two or three minor things that would, would go wrong, you know, and we have to, you know, anticipate those. Uh, and, you know, what are we going to do, you know, come up with, you know, where are the risk areas and, and do some risk tolerance. And, you know, that the reason they're hiring you is to give them a project or product that they can use, uh, you know, whatever, no matter what it is, usually with us, it's physical products of some yeah. kind and they want it to work. You know, the product isn't, it isn't necessarily the product. It's them accomplishing what they want to do with, you know, the robot or whatever. Yeah. And that's, you know, I think that's where a lot of time and material falls short is you don't actually get to make sure that it is, you know, you're, you're involved in the successful completion. Oh, of I, mean, I still stay awake at night thinking of client success, you know. And oh, I do too. Or not. Yeah. And, you know, uh, we got into this business probably because we wanted to help, you know, we love solving problems, first of yeah. all. 
and we want uh, you know our clients to be successful. You know, they're coming to us to make money. They're spending yeah. money to make money. They're yeah. taking risk, and you know, I I want to go through every you know possible way that I can make them money. Yeah. Uh, in their uh, in their you know their endeavor here. That's certainly an admirable goal. Yeah. Uh, another thing about time and material jobs for the client is, you know, it's hard to estimate hours sometimes. It absolutely is. And uh, I think that's another reason we switched to this model is because we were spending on the front end of a project that, that maybe was worth, you know, I want to say like a thousand hours we were spending. Oh, wow. Years, uh, I'll put myself another one. Maybe a thousand hour project, we're spending like 15% of that. It's like 150 hours just to estimate out the project. Right. And so, you know, it was, it was a lot of risk on, on the side of SKA. It was a lot of risk for me. Um, oftentimes, you know, we were paying people hourly to put in, you know, kind of upfront estimations on that stuff. So that was the financial risk. And uh, it, it added up. It just became untenable. Absolutely. I mean, that's... Uh, you know, part of my my background too has been, you know, it was it was with a product development company, and we had to, you know, people would come in and tell us, you know, we want X Y Z. So I got a lot of experience in developing costs, and we we go back and uh, check how you know close we were to what we were initially thought, and you know, it was an iterative process. Well, we, we got better and better, and we got quicker at it. Yeah, and, and we do that too. And so every time we estimate something out, we always check against that estimate to see how close we got. And right. as a result, me and everyone I work with become better estimators every time we do that. Sure. So the other thing I, I like to keep in, in mind is when you are uh, looking at the, the project, if the end seems too far away, I say you can't see the end from the beginning. You know, so... If uh, you know somebody comes in and says, I want a machine that does X, Y, Z, and I say, okay, let's run through, you know, give me you know, three weeks, a month, whatever, and let me come up with, uh, you know, four or five concepts that are viable, and we'll see what we want to do there, and that'll be X, Y, you know, Z dollars, you know, however much it costs yeah. to do that for my time, my brain power, you know, me to check out, you know, certain, you know, is there a product that already does this? And uh, then we, we gather after that time and they say, okay, we like that. We'd like to continue. Let's develop concept A. And we'll go and map out, you know, what I call uh, from the concept to the preliminary design. And we'll, 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 we'll set up aside that time. And a lot of times I'll give a refund for the previous work. So I'll bill higher for the, the concept and then give back, you know, a certain percentage of that towards the second part of the so project. So you make it deductible. So I'm, yeah, it's essentially a deductible or a refund, however you want to view it. But it's an incentive for them to use me again to bring this further. Uh, and I always like to have, you know, uh, people that could, you know, also do this, you know, just to say, you know, if you, you want to take this, you know, this is a guy I know, you could probably do it. Um, and we have a common friend that, you know, he, he's he knows people and he connects yeah, people yeah likes introducing people a lot yeah so you know and he, i've started doing that more lately i've noticed that absolutely you know, and you'll find that you know you'll get more uh leads and everything once well, people seem to really appreciate it too i mean absolutely yeah. you put money in their pocket and, yeah I don't know, funny how they're your new best friend <laughs> uh anyway yeah so just keep going like that and then between the preliminary and the, the final design and we have a, a detailed design where we actually deliver the the uh, the final prints, you know, all those stages, you know, we're giving them rebates to you know continue working with us. If you know, we only give that money back if they continue to work with us. So it's a way to you know they they know it's a firm price to get this work done, and then we we can move it on. But it keeps the the, the whole scope of the project, you know, as far as dollars you know, contained, and they can say like, well, we know it's not going to cost more than this. Yeah, it makes sense. And that for a business, they, they see, well, it's either, you know, 60 to $80, $100 an hour for this work. And we estimate 
that it's this many hours. And surprise, surprise, it's double that. Yeah. Happens all the time. Uh, it does happen all the time. When I found, like, especially when you're green, like, you know, at least when I was, you would get clients that would tell you, and, and I still hear it, but I, I know it's a red flag now, so I watch out for it. I'm not saying I have contempt for clients, because, I mean, you know, without clients, you wouldn't be able to do this work. You know, they're, they're critical. I mean, you know, it, it takes a bunch of parties to do commerce. But what I will say is that there are some, you know, maybe non-scrupulous ones out there that will say, oh, it's going to be simple. Don't worry. This, this yeah, is trivial. Simple. Anytime you hear that, run for the hills. Yeah. Man, that's... It's going to be anything but. And so that's that's been my experience. I will say, though. I like the word simple and solutions. Yeah. You know, a lot a lot of solutions are, are elegant and simple. There is an elegance in simple. Right. So, but yeah, if he, if he tells me the work is going to be simple, it'll only take two hours, and, you know, 40 weeks later, still working on it. You know, yeah, run for the hills. Yeah. This is good, by the way. What is this? The porch it's rocker? It's a rattler. So, I, I oh, it's a lemon. Flavors. Nice. Oh, yeah. lemon. Nice. Yeah, they're, they're fruity. I've been on this diet where I can't drink beer, which is horrible, but I've got all this extra beer in the fridge. So luckily Corey's helped me drink it. I'm on, on the whiskey. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm glad you like it. Yeah. That was actually, uh, that was a Chris Quick special. So Corey shouldn't have said his name, but there's <gasps> a... if you like that beer, check out Chris Quick. <laughs> Anywho. Um, yeah. So uh, what else have you been working on lately? Any any personal projects? Any, uh, uh, any fun work? Talk about it? that. Fair enough. <laughs> no, I got something that I'm I'm kind of keeping under wraps because it's uh, proprietary, so I won't be sharing. No, it. no worries. Uh, I am uh, uh, like about that. to start up another project. Uh, it's actually DoD. Uh, oh. I'm not I'm not the one dealing with the DoD, so yeah. nice. That's the way to do uh, it. But it is interesting because uh, we are taking a specific truck. In a specific trailer, and I won't get into many details here, sure. but um, in times of combat, they want to connect this truck in this trailer without the guy ever getting out of the cab. Oh, cool. Yeah. So there's a, a lot of uh, stuff that's going on there. We're that probably, like a probably, very involved, intricate. Kind of it is a very involved so project. We are. We got a, a great team of uh, people working on it, all uh, private subs for this one guy. And uh, yeah, it's it's a phenomenal solution so far. We've got uh, one part of it uh, where we can actually go out and grab the trailer and bring it back <laughs> in. Uh, that's that's uh, really solid. I'm excited to uh, see that come to life in the next uh, year. So what what level are you out? Is it all in CAD? Is it it's all in CAD right now. I actually 3D printed a uh, model of it. Nice. Uh, one fifth scale, just to you know play around with and have, have it on my shelf. And you don't have to answer this, obviously, if this gets in the proprietary, but how close does the truck have to be the trailer, can you not say? Uh, so we have to be, I think, within a, I think it's 10 inches side to side. That's pretty cool. Up and down, or 10 degrees down, or 10 inches down. I think 20 inches back, going off the top of my head. That's not bad. I mean, that's yeah, I mean, you should be able to, you know, anybody, away. and it will actually... Um, through uh, you could scale 3D cameras, time, it'll yeah. it'll figure out where it needs to be and then go extend and grab it. That's awesome. So it's 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 phenomenal. That's a challenging thing to do, by the way, with 3D cameras, especially if you've got like a chrome plated hitch or something that's reflective to see what the camera is. Well, they aren't chrome plated in this case. Well, I won't say what they are, but yeah, I guess that would uh, that would be reflective and probably not good for a combat situation. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Cool. I'm sorry. Uh, so the difficult part is you need a secondary retention device uh, for retention? Uh, most retention people device. use uh, safety chains. Okay. Uh, and then you need to connect electrical and in this case air. That sounds fun to figure yes, out. Yes, it does sound fun to figure out. So that's uh, most of what my part of the project is. And so I'm not, like... not going to share any okay, fair details enough. on that because I can speculate, but I won't. Yeah. Um, actually, our friend in Boston uh, gave me some good ideas on that. So. Nice. Uh, I was excited for that. Yeah, so we're, we're looking that. at that angle uh, that he suggested, but I'm, I'm not sure that it's going to work uh, simply because of the air connectors because they have to line up in a certain way compared to everything else. So That makes sense. It's It'll be fun. It's going to be yeah. fun. You know, and right now, you're just kind of like, we have a really good concept. And You've got air see... power and hydraulics or water or just... just uh, just... just uh, 
two airlines. So you see him, you know, on a semi trailer. It's got the red and blue okay, line, cool. the blue for trailer brakes, and the red for emergency brakes. Got it. And uh, there, there's there'll be some other uh, pneumatics on it. Uh, one of those things is it's not actually a trailer; it's a wagon. So it pivots at the front. You remember your old radio flyer? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's it's a wagon. That's cool. So it, when you back this thing up, uh, we need to actually lock out the rotation on the wagon so you can back it up. Because otherwise, you get a third point in there and you're just kind of screwing around. So yeah, that makes sense. Uh, not looking forward to uh, trying to back one of those up without. <laughs> and uh, right now, it's funny they have. Uh, I think it's about a one inch pin that you drop in so you can lock out that rotation. Obviously, we can't be dropping in the pin when we're That's supposed to be in the cab. Yeah. So we now need to automate that process as well. Could you use a, um, I guess, I mean, a holding brake is probably not going to be large enough to... Yeah. We have a good concept. Right. We're, we're, we're looking to implement it now. Cool. That's awesome. Sounds like a lot of fun. Good times. Yeah. yeah. So that's about the only... Uh, I guess I got another personal project with... Uh, you know, I like roller coasters. Yeah. And... Uh, I've often been curious as to how they design uh, the roller coaster because a lot of things at play, you know, when you're when you're a little kid, you probably didn't mind the roller coaster being bumpy or jerky. But now that you're an adult, it makes a big difference. Interesting. And you know, part of the reason is because when you're when you're small, you're closer to the track. And if they kind of designed all the forces at the, the, the track because you know you look at particle kinematics where you know particles moving through space yeah um but that's not where we sense motion we sense motion in our ears yeah so we so actually you know as we grow the distance gets bigger from the track that's interesting. and you know it, it doesn't make things as smooth so i'm i'm actually making a it's a very iterative uh solution to uh Making railroad, uh, roller coaster tracks, where it would it would calculate you know the G's and you would actually tell it what kind of G's you want and then make the track fit that so that it's a smooth ride all the way through and uh, you could do that in all six degrees of freedom so you got you know your X Y Z coordinates. So is this a computer program or what? Do you uh, it's basically Excel. Cool. And I iterate a, a thing every inch. Nice. Uh, of the program, and I make sure that. Uh, you know, there's no change in or no drastic change in acceleration because we're talking about g-forces, which are acceleration. Yeah, so you convert those g-forces to um, where you want the tracks to be in 3D space. Right. But what I don't want is, you know, if, if I just look at a particle accelerating up to a certain speed, you know, if I accelerate my car from, you know, zero miles an hour uh, at a constant acceleration up to, you know, 45 miles an hour and then stay at 45 well between at the beginning when i start at zero i have a jolt yeah and i don't want that and then when i stop i have a jolt and yeah. i don't want that either makes sense so what this program will take is you know if, if i want to go you know over the top of a hill and then have you know three and a half g's and i get out of that i can i can make it have three and a half g's and i can yeah. iterate a solution of what... so what's a safe amount of g's for a human to sustain in that uh, generally speaking, it's like four G's. So you can go up, up, to, up to like ten seconds or something. Cool. But you can sustain up to I think it's six. I'd have to look this up again. Don't hold me on this. Yeah. Uh, for like less than a half second or something like that. That's interesting. Uh, which is really hard to get in and out of six G's that quickly. <laughs> uh, but you really can push like the human limit of of endurance uh, as long as you get out of it fast and. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, but it's got to be it's got to be very. Uh, quick like that. So as a result, most people stay, I think, under the four Gs, three and yeah. a half, three Gs. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, just because you know they want people you to like people. this ride too, you know. <laughs> but there are standards on that, which I thought was fun. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, that makes sense because I mean, a lot of people be injured or dead if you screwed that up. Mm -hmm. so. so anyway, as as you come out, you know, let's say it's three and a half Gs through the bottom of a hill, then you come back up, and I want to be at three and a half Gs, and I want to make that tangent G force. You know, three and a half G's, and then transition to maybe a negative G hill where it goes to negative one. Yeah. I want to make sure that's as smooth as it can possibly be. You know, yeah, I was yeah. I was at uh, uh, Cedar Point yesterday, and we rode Magnum XL, which was like the first 
hyper coaster, which is over 200 feet tall. And so that has it's a hyper coaster is that height. Yeah, it's 200 feet. The okay. Pika coaster would be 300 feet. Strata coaster is 400 feet. Oh, cool. Yeah. How many Strata coasters exist? Three that I know, or two that I know of. There may be a third. Nice. Anyway, I went on one yesterday too. That's awesome. Top of the extra. <laughs> uh, so, what's wrong with this? You were talking about three and a half G's being three and a half the G's. limit you typically stick to for safety reasons. Right. So if I was tangent G force. There you go. Man, you're a great recapper. I get a good thirty second recall. There you go. Yeah. So if I wanted to go right into a negative G hill where it's actually throwing me out with one G, I want to make that transition smooth and then hold that there. So this this thing will calculate that out. You know, I'm I'm sure it's. Probably something similar to what the big guys are using. So if you want to hold three and a half G's, that means you got to keep moving, and eventually I got to keep. Yeah, eventually you go into a loop. That's how that goes. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, one of the interesting things was, but you also aren't being powered when you're at least with the launch coaster. You're not. Is that typical of roller coasters, or are there ones that are constantly being? So that's the other thing is your, you know, basic physics tells you that as you go up, you're losing speed, so you have to have a tighter and tighter radius at the top interesting to make that and you know with my cart i have to have at minimum a, a 18 foot loop if i wanted to make a loop yes i've looked at it yeah yeah uh, so that it, just because then if you go any narrower than that the linear bearings won't ride the track well uh, the cart ends up hitting the track okay that makes sense so i've got to keep it far enough out and that's why you know you see loops and they're pretty big yeah uh you know it's one, so you don't pass out from all the G-forces. That makes sense. And then two, you need to, uh, you know, be able to fit the cart inside. Yeah, and three and a half G is pretty insane. I it mean, is pretty insane. Three and a half times Earth's gravity, that's, that's a lot of force for a person. There's a lot feel. of force, so that's one of my pet projects that I've been working on for a couple months now. That's cool. When I when I get time and I'm sure this is this is pretty like solid math, but like how do you substantiate the results and, and test it? Like what do you I guess I gotta go out and build another one. <laughs> I'm excited to see the video when that comes out. Right. Oh, so back to my point about Magnum XL. Uh that one is probably, you know, was the first it was built in nineteen eighty nine when you know we didn't really have computers widespread as they are now. And you could see the track and it's you're coming down a hill and it'll be straight track and then it'll be a curve and then straight track and then go down and it, it so like just the first does stealth it. fighter where it's just built, all built out of triangles because that's the math right do. however as you can imagine you know with uh, assuming their velocity is the same throughout the radius uh you're and you have a constant radius curve your centripetal acceleration comes on immediately so you have no g-force g-force and then no g-force again so you just <laughs> so you yeah, experience that it, when it, you're riding this roller coaster yep yesterday yeah it's it's still a good coaster but it, you know it's just like i can see exactly why this happens you know it's not curved into lack it. of being able to do the math to make anything more complex right yeah that makes a lot of sense so very interesting stuff i mean it's it's nerding out it's, it's no, calculus no, too yeah and i, I would think i mean the level of calculus you'd have to do to make one that's that's more graceful than that. I mean, a human's not capable of it. You would need a computer program. Right. Again, I mean, I, don't know, I, I guess I recently read the Skunk Works book by Ben Rich from Lockheed about Martin. The, uh, yeah, yeah, that'd be a good one to read. It's a good read. I recommend it. They talk about a lot about the SR-71. They do talk a lot about the SR-71. Uh, and then the other thing they talk about is the Stealth Fighter. And I think Grumman did the Stealth Bomber, so that was a different company. Yeah. But the Stealth Fighter, when they came out with it, I think what they did was they skimmed um, I believe it was a Russian research paper they found from like a university, I think in Moscow, I might be wrong on this, but it, basically somebody figured out a formula for like the radio, um, sorry, the, the radar cross section, uh, of, of like any given shape. Mm. So you could, you could figure out like how big something looked on radar and it was different than the actual, like wow, that's cool. dimensions. Yeah. And so. And I guess the Russian government was like, well, that's not interesting to us. And so it just got published. And Lockheed Martin found it, and they, they built the first stealth fighter using that map. Whoa. And so, yeah. I mean, well, if you look at the SR-71, I mean. <laughs> it's, 
the titanium yeah, so. from Russia to build that. I don't know if you're aware of that. No, yeah. that's crazy. And so, I mean, the U.S. just didn't have enough natural titanium at the time. I, I, I don't know if we do even now, man. I, there's a lot of titanium that comes from Russia. And so um, what happened was, us, or, sorry, Lockheed Martin set up all these shell corporations to purchase titanium. Now, I'm told, I don't know if this is true, but the story I was told by another engineer I work with is that they set them up as cookware companies, which is funny when you consider like the thermal properties of titanium are not great for cookware. So right. yeah, that's it's, it's kind of a half-assed cover. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah, we crazy built crazy. a bunch of them. So yeah, no, it's interesting stuff. I don't know. I mean, I, I you know, haven't done a whole lot of defense work, but I'm, I'm interested in the history. And I, I yeah, absolutely. It. Yeah. It's fun to, to read, you know, some of those amazing projects, you know, like the Empire State Building was built in a year or something Are like you that. Are serious? Yeah, it's not uh, maybe From design to, to like being finished or uh, well, I don't think the design, but okay. you know, the actual construction of it was wow. like all done. Like it was a so story. The design was probably laid laid out for a while beforehand and they had it really, really oh, dialed. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, just reading about, you know, that and the St. Louis Arch and Statue of Liberty is another cool one. What about the Statue of Liberty? Because I, I I've been in it. Um, although I, I have to admit it was closed. You couldn't climb through it when I visited as a kid. Oh yeah. I went. It was down for maintenance, I think. So they were they were fixing some section. Um, but I I got to at least see the base of it and walk up close. And mm. I'm in New York City enough. I mean, my parents live there. As do my brother. Just moved from Brooklyn to Austin, Texas. So he doesn't live there yeah. anymore. Austin's a great city. I I like it better than Brooklyn. Oh good. But uh, sorry, Brooklyn. But uh, my sister just brought in Manhattan. Big, big big sky. When everybody's really friendly there. It's it's not really arrogant. I, I feel like it's it's cultured, but it's not pretentious. Mm-hmm. I, I, and that probably sounds pretentious, but I yeah. really like that city a lot. Yeah, Austin's cool. Um, New York's cool too. So Statue of Liberty. Um, what's the story that you know about that? Uh, just you know how they came up. Uh, there's a double helix staircase in there. Yeah. So that they they built it for people. So that's the staircase I couldn't go into when I visited. It. Sure, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's it's interesting because, you know, they have, you know, it's like DNA where it wraps around yeah, each other like this. Bit. So you can have a passage of people going up and a passage of people coming down and they, awesome. don't, they don't meet each other. Oh, you can hear them from the other side. You I'm can, sure. You know, reach yeah. around your arm and bang around and something. But, you know. Even when it was made. You know? <laughs> right. It, and then you get up in the top and you're like, this isn't all that big. I mean, literally, it's no bigger than the width of this garage across the yeah. head. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, that's still a pretty big head, though. When you think about it, it it's definitely big. But you know, yeah. you think it's like huge, and no, it's not that big. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and you're actually looking out of the crown that she's wearing. So yeah, no, I'm aware of that. Um, just because I mean, I've seen it up close, right. and I've, yeah, I mean, it's in Ghostbusters. So. It is in Ghostbusters. Yeah. <laughs> so... uh, I remember, uh, you know, as a kid, there was this bolt or the nut that you could see mounting the whole thing. It was literally about, you know, six, eight inches and you need a six, eight inch wrench to, to tighten that thing up. And I was just like, wow, I don't think I'll ever see a nut bigger than that. That's so cool. I might say the super bolts we used at Joy Mining where it was, it was a big bolt and you would tighten it down and then there was a circle of little bolts around it. Really? It really torqued it in place. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, they were kind of cool. It was just for a larger yeah, that, that type of joint is used in a lot of places just to... Yeah. Um, uh, rotary actuators use that where they have a big bolt to kind of sandwich everything together. Yeah. And then what actually takes the torque is the, the circle, the little circle bolts. That's awesome. Yeah. I, um, I think I've told the story already, but one of the things I remember the most from being there is when somebody over torqued a bolt and it got embedded in concrete. Ooh. So it necked and then, uh, it yielded and then it shot across the room and then luckily nobody died. Yeah. Usually they don't shoot unless they, yeah. they break. This so, one broke, and uh, a lot of times when you neck a bolt, you I've, just, I've you can just keep too. keep doing it until it just you've got a thin, very uh, yeah messed up piece of metal. And, yeah, now, I've, I've I've seen that as well. I mean, especially when I used to do battle bots for fun, which I don't think I've talked about on this. Oh um, yeah, battle bots. You experienced a lot of failure modes that you've learned about in school, but never seen in real life, and so it was interesting. Like you got to see a lot of exaggerated. Um, Things that went wrong mm-hmm. because you, you're intentionally breaking stuff. So. Yeah. We were talking about bolts earlier, and since we're on the subject, I'll, sure. I'll bring this up. Uh, one of the pro- problems I had to work with a big team on 
was we had a problem with uh, stress corrosion cracking on bolts. And most bolts, when you use them, they're going to fail by pulling and they'll, they'll neck down and they'll eventually fail. Stress corrosion cracking is entirely different. It happens between like a week and a month of the bolt being torqued for the first time and the head will pop off. Wow. Yeah, right in the neck. And there's really no it's warning for stress riser that you've got of having that, that yeah. angle between the head. And well, the, it's the a bolt. chemical problem. Oh, interesting. It uh, has, has to do with the, the plating. Um, and what happens is there's, there's there, there ends up being hydrogen in the bolt. It leaves, it starts eating the material. It's kind of creepy. Wow. And, you know, we were, we would be out in the... But why does it attack that area in particular? Uh, there, there's a couple things that go on with that. But essentially, it's where, you know, that's the highest stress part of the bolt. Okay. Makes sense. Uh, and that's, it likes the highest stressed area. Uh, it needs um, an anode. It needs uh, a susceptible material, which these were uh, above grade eight bolts. Yeah. And it needs an initial hard defect. prone. We talked about this. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, yeah. It, and it needs an initial defect, which could be as simple as the guy installing the washer upside down. Yes, that's a real thing. So it's because there's stamped a certain. Well, you, we, you told me about yeah, we were, I'm just repeating you. So yeah, there's a um, you know washers are stamps. It's a stamp process where you have a, a circular metal or probably a sheet that comes down and it presses the outside and it cuts the hole on the inside, but the material comes out on the bottom and it leaves a sharper edge. So if you install that upside down, it could now be in that small radius on the bolt shank coming down and where the head is. And that could be enough. I mean, it could be even smaller, something smaller, like they dropped it on the floor and it, you know, left a little scratch on. I mean, something that small. Uh, and this is, you know, it's got a lot of things have to come together. But anyway, between like seven and 28 days later, bing, you 28 hit, days you later, you say? Yeah, it's, it's a while. zombie movie, so that's not yeah, Exactly. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, but I got it. So like uh, like one to four weeks later, it's it's gone. Right. It'll just pop the head of it. And you have to you know back out the the, the bolt, and uh, man, those things will shoot. They'll go like 30, 40 feet in the air. Holy crap! Yeah, it's terrifying. It is terrifying. It would. And we had a a giant response to that uh, problem. You know, with the company I worked at, and uh, now they've gotten away from using Did you have that happen in a product or was that something that happened on a very limited basis it was a it was a product so we, it was a multiple we, failures across different products that were already deployed uh it had to do with a specific size faster so we knew yeah what i'm saying it wasn't one off in the lab this was something that you had to this was in production yes call. yeah and it was a, a fun problem one to contain one to come up with a a, a service plan and then another one to figure out how it's not going to happen again. It so, does sound like fun. Uh, you know, a very large and very urgent matter because, uh, you know, people were depending on this bolt to work. Yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, yeah, it was it was a lot of man hours and uh, a lot of uh, worry on my head, my part. Just making sure we have safe products rolling out the door. And yeah, of course. We ended up uh, having you to buy. The they're already out safe. I mean, you want to. We had, you know, field, you know, most of the trucks that we had uh, were past the 28 day point. So we would ask them, you know, to go ahead and do a, a torque check on the bolts uh, just to make sure. Did that ever set the failure off? Like to, to torque it down a little more? How that, that was the goal off? is we would torque them at 90% just to make sure that they were tight. If they broke down, then we'd replace them all. Oh, cool. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a hard and fast, like every one of these bolts would have this Gotta problem. Gotta go, yeah. Uh, but we ended up do we ended up replacing, I'll say, most of the units that we had. Yeah. And it was unclear as to, you know, bolts. Bolts are identified uh, by lot if you request it. So you, you obviously have to pay for it. Yeah. But the more... Uh, the more bolts you, you know, sure it's less buy, expensive than a mass failure on the client side. Absolutely, especially this bolt because it was, uh, you know, imminent danger, and sure. serious bodily injury. Yeah. Uh, so yes, we had you know very specific uh, plans of how to contain bolts out in the field, 
bolts on the, on the plant. We actually ended up renting out uh, a bunch of vacant fields and parking trucks there <laughs> uh, just so we could keep production going. And then we'd go back and replace all these bolts that we needed to. So you would just run them with legacy production. Then once you figured it out, you would apply. Right. Well, 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 we had a supply chain issue of getting these bolts. Yeah. And it's we can't just shut down a shop for oh I see six so weeks while we're waiting for all those bolts. You would you would have it built the rest of the way. Yep. And then I mean, you would you would do that final step once you solve the problem. You were able to crack the supply chain issue and get the, the right. bolts. Okay. And we we decided that it was financially better for us to do that than to shut everything down and. You know, have people out and get behind in production. Yeah. Whereas we can go and get you know, uh, twenty extra people to change bolts all day. Yeah, it's a massive production. It's a massive production thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. I've I've been to facilities where um, like it's a big operation, but they don't even have storage designed in because they um. This is like a pretty Japanese philosophy to do that, right? Yeah, the lean manufacturing. Yeah. So we're we're practicing. We nah, this company was a practitioner of ma lean manufacturing. I think that is truly the way to go if you're going to be competitive. Uh, there's a couple of reasons, and just off the top of my head, one, you get faster throughput, which you don't think you do, if especially when you're like if you're at a machining center and you you like I make this weldment and machine it, and then I I put it over here and I got to change all my tooling. And then do this one, and then I have to make another one of that first part and go back. Yeah, it just doesn't make sense how that would be faster, but you know, <laughs> in study after study, it is. Uh, but the other great thing is you can actually catch defects much quicker and less costly. Interesting. Uh, with the lean manufacturing, which is one of its real appeals. How does that work? Uh, well, you you know you get it, get it through the process quicker rather than you know if I. Do you remember the scene from uh, Batman Begins where he orders that the little time. Batman thing or the little logo? And it's, he had to order 10,000 to make it not look, you know, uh, suspicious. And they were all wrong and he had to throw all 10,000 away and then buy another 10,000. <laughs> you know, that that's essentially what, you know, that's bulk manufacturing or batch manufacturing. And, you know, that's what they're doing there. With yeah. lean, you know, you'd order one, make sure it's right. Or 20 and, in some cases. Right. It depends on how, you know, if it's uh, like a bent part or something, you might want to run more than one or something. But yeah, uh, just because there can be variants. But you check the design, you check how it's fitting, you check how it's doing in production, and then you can go back and, uh, you know, make changes. And you don't have 30 trucks sitting there that all need the specific change because yeah, one small process screwed up. Yeah, that makes sense. That's cool. I was actually having this debate with a colleague recently, or I guess this conversation rather, where um, this person is is working on a company and make a product, and the debate that they're going through is: Do I make one at a time on the CNC machine, or do I use a tombstone and make twenty at a time with this part? And what they've been leaning toward, they've they've been doing the tombstone method, but what they've been leaning toward is automating placement of one part. And, and doing a pipeline where that one part gets all the operations done. Sure. Because apparently if something goes wrong, like you said, you don't have to trash an entire batch. You know, you can. You That's know, true. You address it, you fix it, and then, you know, you go on with the rest of your run. All right. I've experienced the same thing with uh, 3D printing where I'll put, you know, five or six parts and one of them isn't printing right. And then you go to the next one and it's pretty fine. But the other one's like a big, you know, pile of spaghetti, you know, spaghetti at this yeah. point. And, uh, you know, you every five minutes you go over there and clean it out, and, <laughs> you know, so you, you lost one part, but, you know, do I now run a, a whole new setup just to make that one part or do I run another batch? You know, if you're trying to do this for production, you know, you got to figure out why is that not working and you know, solve that. And it's so really hard to do when you have 12 parts on there as opposed to just one. You'll have a bed of six parts and you only have one of them turned to spaghetti where the other ones will work fine. But I have no idea. I'm just throwing it out there. Well, no, no, no. But I mean, even if you did two, like I'm asking, like what failure mode would cause one part to to fail in that way where the other one wouldn't? Uh, I just haven't done. Could a whole be lot anything. Of like so. Four bed adhesion would be the the big. Okay, so it's good enough that it worked in this case, but you had a failure over here. 
Right. Okay, that makes sense. Or, you know, maybe there was something wrong with the nozzle or you were changing in the filament right there. You'd uh, screw partial something. clog, now you're printing in the air over here where you were printing. Yeah. Right okay, that makes sense. Uh, it could be a bunch of things. I mean, I just need it up, okay? I'm just trying to understand it, man. <laughs> Very simple space guy. But, uh, yeah, that's cool. Um, I uh, enjoy talking about this a lot. So, um... I feel like we're kind of hitting hitting a good kind of natural stuff sure, yeah. here. Uh, is there anything you want to plug? Uh, sure. So uh, if you're interested in uh, some help with your uh, mechanical design project, uh, do a lot of hydraulic uh, work, uh, machine design, uh, troubleshooting, just general en engineering uh, work, you can visit me at rasmussendesigns.net. That's R-A-S-M-U-S-S-E-N-D-E-S-I-G-N-S. -S -S -E Excellent. And uh, if you are interested in becoming a better engineer, go visit mentoredengineer.com. I don't think I need to spell it out, but yeah, uh, mentored engineer. Oh, wow. Um, and buy my course, yeah. Check out the YouTube videos too, they're free yeah, they're, and it's it's a great little teaser. I had a great time making that roller coaster, and you know, just uh, I, I'll be honest that that one about the launch, I watch that like once a week because <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's so fun, you know. Had a great time building that with my kids and awesome. teaching them about physics. If you stuck around this long and you like what you've heard, please give us a like and smash that subscribe button. Or smash that like button and give us a subscribe. We're always looking for new and interesting people to have on the show. If you know anyone good, send an email to podcast at ska.solutions or leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and please come to the next one.